Okay. Um, and to be first out of the shoot uh, after lunch. So that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of the town of Silta, I'd like to welcome uh, the new commissioners. Uh, you have a, a big job and uh, certainly appreciate your willingness to serve. Um, the town uh, of Silt appreciates its role in the Western and Rural Local Government Coalition. Uh, we've been uh, involved since uh, 2000, uh, since last year, and uh, want to take a, just a second here, this opportunity to shout out to uh, Garfield County Commissioner's uh, leadership that they've shown in this, um, in this arena. We understand how important uh, it is for the Commission to develop regulations that serve all Coloradans, uh, wherever they are, and uh, that's, that's, I guess, quite the challenge for the Commission. Um, the oil and gas industry has been critical uh, to our community over the years. You know, it uh, paved our streets for the very first time in the 1980s. And since then, uh, the industry has provided uh, not only good jobs to the folks who live here, uh, but also revenues to fund uh, our hospital, our local hospital uh, over in Rifle, and uh, our schools, our social services, our libraries, public and, and public safety, of course. Um, without this revenue, uh, we would likely dry up and blow away. And today I can say that with all certainty because it's pretty windy out here. Um, we are very rural. We're a very rural part of Colorado. We live amidst wide open spaces and we can probably tolerate oil and gas operations better than a more densely population, uh, more densely populated uh, communities along uh, the Front Range. We encourage the Commission to develop rules that recognize those differences. The uh, Town of Silt supports the overarching goals of the newly formed COGCC. Uh, we love our environment too. Uh, after all, that's why we live out here. And we hope that the commission will work alongside us to make rules that serve all of us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and uh, good luck. And uh, uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing the results of your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have um, Elise Ackerman Castleberry from Delta County. And Ms. Castleberry, give me a moment and I'll have you unmuted. Ms. Castleberry, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. All right, well, good afternoon, commissioners, and welcome um, to the task ahead of you. We know it's going to be challenging. Um, I'd like to echo the comments that were just made uh, by the town of Silt. Um, Delta County uh, located, we're really the southern edge of the Peon Basin um, and are part of the Western and Rural Coalition as well. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to coordinate and collaborate together. It allows us um, to really get some technical expertise and assistance in evaluating the complexity of all of the rulemaking that is underway right now since we have limited staff that can be dedicated to that effort. Um, I wanted to hit on a few things unique to Delta County. Um, we really refer to ourselves as a pass-through county for the most part. We do have a little bit of oil and gas activity and there is some potential for future oil and gas activity, but the majority of drilling that occurs uh, in our areas actually occurring in Gunnison County. Uh, the employees for that often come out of Delta County and then Delta County is who experiences the pass through, um, whether it's of traffic, whether it's the pipelines that are moving uh, the, the, the gas out of the region. Um, and most importantly, it's our watershed. And as you know, we have a very strong agricultural history here in Delta County with a lot of organic farms. A lot of our residents and farmers are concerned about impacts to water quality. Um, we really want to encourage that as you in partake on the rulemaking process and continue to move forward, that you really allow for and encourage intergovernmental cooperation, whether that's between the state and the federal agencies. Most of the activity in our area is on federal lands. Um, there, brings a unique dynamic to the table that must be taken into consideration during the rulemaking process. 
but that you also consider that relationship between the state and the local governments and even local government to local government. Um, we have a long history of coordinating and collaborating together. and We want to make sure that this process continues to foster that. Um, as Jeff said from SILT, we are concerned about our health, our air, our environment. Um, we are natural resource based communities. Our economy is driven by natural resources. That includes recreation, includes our agriculture, um, includes our lifestyles and everything else. So we do want to see good, strong, communicative regulations that are protective of the things that matter to us, um, but that also strike a balance and allow for uh, reasonable growth to happen where it is most appropriate. For us, this rulemaking process is essential as a pass-through county and as a county that really was one of the first in the gate in terms of local control many years ago. Um, we have a strong sense that duplicative regulations are not beneficial to anybody. Um, we would like to see this process move expeditiously so that we understand what the state is going to regulate and how they're going to regulate. That puts us in a better position of creating our own and recreating our local government regulations in a way that are not duplicative and then can address our unique and specific issues. I think that's all I'll say for now. Thank you very much for this opportunity and look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Jane Bowder. Uh, County Commissioner from Logan County. Uh, Commissioner, you are unmuted. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. And I'd like to start by uh, um, welcoming you to your new roles as commissioners. Logan County has always appreciated working with the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission to ensure safe and successful oil and gas development in our area. You have an incredible staff to support your work. We appreciate the extraordinary effort of the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission staff as they have engaged stakeholders over the last year and crafted draft rules that protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Um, since the early 2019, Logan County elected officials has been in partnership with the 23 member Western Rural Local Government Coalition the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, staff and other stakeholders to help craft the very best regulations that will be appropriate and flexible enough to work well in not only the urban front range, but also well um, in Logan County and more rural areas. A little bit about Logan County. Uh, we're located up in the Northeast corner of the state. Our population is approximately 22,000 people. But compared to other counties, we have an unusually high percentage of oil and gas workers. It's actually approximately four times higher than the average Colorado County, second only to farming and ranching. Um, it is also ranked number two as one of the highest paying jobs in Logan County. We appreciate these companies and their employees. Uh, they're an essential part of our economy and we are going to have some huge deficits in our budget if uh, if we put unrealistic and financially burdensome regulations in place that hurt our small operators. Senate Bill 19-181 empowered local governments to regulate siting of oil and gas locations and address surface nuisance issues, including lights, noise, odors, traffic, dust, and visual mitigation on a co-equal basis with a COGCC. We look forward to participating in the mission change rulemaking and working with you to craft rules that equally respect local government and Colorado Oil and Gas Commission's authority and statutory requirements to regulate oil and gas sites and the surface impacts in a manner that protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. We see opportunity for an effect effective and collaborative partnership between our counties and the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission that will serve our constituents as well as all of Colorado. For many rural communities and our governments, oil and gas operations are an important economic driver. Our local communities are much more dependent on the goods and the jobs and the tax revenues um, that, that, that this industry provides. They fund essential services such as hospitals, fire departments, social and health services, schools and libraries. Front range communities 
where most of the con conflict between the oil and gas and the dense urban neighborhoods is happening have the luxury of far more diverse economies than, than rural Colorado. So once again, I cannot stress enough that statewide one size fits all rulemaking does not fit Colorado rules can and should be tailored to urban versus rural needs while equally protecting public health, safety, and welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Next up, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner Rose Puglesi from Mesa County. And Commissioner, I will unmute you and you'll be ready to go here. Can you hear us? All Commissioner? right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm Rose Puglisi. I'm a Mesa County Commissioner, and um, I want to welcome the new Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. I think that you have an exciting and very important job for all of Coloradans. And, um, and I want to tell you a little bit about Mesa County and Northwest Colorado, and then some of the exciting projects that we have um, working for us in the oil and gas industry. So Mesa County is the hub of the energy industry for Northwest Colorado. So while we do not have as much drilling as some of our neighbor counties, we do have um, the service industries here and a lot of the employees live in, in Mesa County as do their families. And so oil and gas and our natural resources are an important part of our economy. We are all struggling through this COVID pandemic and um, there's going to be shortfalls in budgets. And what we need and what the business community needs is certainty and oil and gas um, regulations need to have some certainty for our businesses. That's gonna be really important to make sure we can continue our strong economy and that we don't fail um, as we are going through a tough economic crisis. We have generally seen fluctuations in the natural gas market, but we have an exciting opportunity that we've been working on in Northwest Colorado for several years and that is the Jordan Cove natural gas, uh, liquefied natural gas export facility in Coos Bay, Oregon, which just got its final federal approvals um, last week. And so those, um, that will take uh, liquefied natural gas or natural gas from Northwest Colorado, specifically in the Peons Basin, um, which has enough natural gas just in the Peons Basin to power the whole state of California for 50 years. So we have an abundance of the resource and no markets um, except through this LNG export facility in Coos Bay, Oregon, that would take Colorado's, um, Northwest Colorado's gas and export it through this facility to Japan. And a lot of our operators already have contracts with the Japanese to do that. Now what this does is also bring, um, I'm a mom, I've got two small kids that I'm raising in this community. I care about clean air and clean water, just like all of you, but we can have good paying jobs and um, also balance environmental concerns. And so what is so exciting about this project, this Jordan Cove project, is that um, in exporting our natural gas resources to um, countries that are currently burning dirty fuels into our environment, we will have the opportunity in Northwest Colorado to um, really clean up our global environment. And that is an exciting project for the environment, but also for jobs in our economy. So we just wanna tell you a little bit um, about our community. We are not the front range. Our access to the resource is different. Our topography is different. So we ask that you take those into account as you do this rulemaking. And then finally, thank you again for this opportunity and for serving. Um, we wanna make sure you remember that the people that work in the oil and gas industry, they're our friends and our neighbors, they're our families, they go to our schools, they contribute to our 4-H and FAIR projects. They are our friends and neighbors. So as you are considering rulemaking, please consider the lives and livelihood of our families. So thank you again for this opportunity and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Commissioner. So we're gonna go back and call on a few folks who we had called on earlier this morning. Um, I see that they're in the meeting. So we'll start with Mr. Ian Thomas Tafoya. Mr. Tafoya, um, you should be unmuted and uh, ready to go. <clears throat> Hello, commissioners. I'm excited for you all today too. <clears throat> uh, this new process and a new time for all of us. I mean, everything globally is changing. Everything's changing when it comes to white supremacy. Everything's coming when it's changing, coming to change for public health. I'm really excited about all of that. <clears throat> So my name is Ian Thomas Tafoya, and I work for Green Latinos, which is a national environmental organization that convenes um, 
and Latinos to fight for public health and conservation issues. I'm the first organizer in the state of Colorado and I built my career fighting in 80216 um, against a highway expansion around refineries, around um, asphalt and concrete factories, and this cumulative and comprehensive impact of pollution that's happening in communities. Um, I'm here today to say that I'm really appreciative of this new process as we move forward for community engagement via um, portals like this. I still think there's more work to be done to help people understand when they can speak, how we can integrate translation. I'm working with the Air Quality Control Commission and I've been talking to the Water Quality Control Division about how do we streamline processes so it becomes very easy for someone like me or someone who I'm trying to train in civics to participate in a process like this. Much like the pollution we talk about not being a vacuum, neither do these hearings. In fact, I missed the meeting this morning and my name being called because I was testifying at a Water Control Commission. There, there's no reason why we can't work between agencies to make sure these very important hearings aren't occurring at the exact same time. Many of the mothers and the people that I help organize with, the mothers I hear wake with asthma in the middle of the night, the cancer, the things they're most worried about, they're already pressed to the limits and I think this process can be improved and so I definitely wanna talk about that. Now, I've been all across the state of Colorado. I work all across the state of Colorado. I've heard some people here from the North Fork and from Grand Valley. There are members of those communities who don't believe that the local government represents them in a meaningful way, that they do good outreach um, in multiple languages to get people into the seats. In fact, Silt, which is not very far from Rifle, I was there for an air quality control mission here, here in, back in November. And people were walking in there with shirts that say, go home wetbacks. Yes, I hadn't heard that since the 90s, and this is the place. <clears throat> where a Juneteenth rally just took place a few weeks ago, surrounded by white supremacists. So there, there are communities with voices who feel afraid. There are communities with voices who, who are on the margins right now, who live on these fence lines, that need you to put public health and safety first. And what we're learning here is that things are being exposed, long-term exposure to air pollution and these things are directly related to the deaths that are happening here. I believe that you have a responsibility to fight for these people. And we know that means in the short term, whether that means mitigating issues from point source pollution to long-term solutions, which have to do with climate change. When I hear people talking about exporting um, to internationally our natural gas, why are there people in our community that are taking on the pain, taking on the medical bills and the asthma so that these middle stream businesses can pass them on? I've said this loud and clear across all of these meetings to people all across Colorado, that they can join us in uncoupling their financial spending. I've worked in three branches of local government and I've worked at three levels of government. And there's no reason in my mind that we can't find new financial mechanisms that don't place people short-term or long-term in harm's way. No one wants Foya, us- to... I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but your time has expired. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Next up, we have Ms. Giselle Hersfeld. Ms. Hersfeld, um, you are unmuted and are ready to speak. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Giselle Hersfeld and I'm 23 years old. I've never been more terrified for the future than I am now. I often lay awake at night in panic, unable to sleep because of the rapid and escalating degradation of our planet. I spent the last four years getting my college degree to kickstart my future, only to graduate and ask, what future? I want you to understand that every day I grieve the loss of countless global habitats due to climate change. Every day I grieve, I grieve for the millions of people being displaced from their homes due to rising sea levels and increasing natural disasters. I grieve for the communities whose air, water, and land are being polluted and poisoned by extractive industries for the sake of economic growth. The thing about constant and unregulated economic growth is that, is that it is not sustainable. It is not humane. Our modern capitalist rationality allows us to place profit margins over human lives and fragile ecosystems. And while I recognize that the issue of fracking is complicated and that the COGCC members are placed in a difficult position, I ask you to please recognize that my own future and my ability to have a future is being compromised and sold out in favor of economic growth and profit for a globally detrimental extractive industry. You have heard community members speak passionately about our experiences as families being poisoned by wells in our neighborhoods, as mothers worried for their children's health with wells dangerously close to their schools, and as young people fearing for our futures. I am disturbed that now in 2020, amidst a global respiratory health pandemic, we even have to question whether eliminating fracking is a good idea. 
it has been proven that fracking dramatically reduces our air quality and that breathing polluted air puts people severely more at risk for respiratory complications due to COVID-19. The oil and gas lobby can give you all the justifications and financial incentives and legal obfuscations in the world, but they cannot give you a good answer to our community's cries for help. I'm not coming to you as a politician or as a lobbyist. I'm coming to you as a young person who is deeply and overwhelmingly terrified for our future, given our current trajectory. This isn't about a paycheck for me, this is about survival. I ask you to please halt all new permitting for oil and gas wells. Stop bailing out the collapsing oil and gas industry. Force the industry to deal responsibly with orphaned wells and create a comprehensive plan to phase out oil and gas development in Colorado. Alternative clean energy sources exist and can and should be developed in their place. I ask you to please start putting the safety of the people of Colorado first. Thank you, Ms. Herzfeld. Next, we have Mr. Nathan Bellinger. Mr. Bellinger, you've been unmuted. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Um, my name is Nathan Bellinger. I'm a staff attorney at Our Children's Trust, and I'm representing Earth Guardians and Our Children's Trust in the Mission Change Rulemaking. I wanted to briefly welcome the new commissioners and echo the thanks to taking on this important job, especially at this point in time. I wanted to use my time today to remember and reflect on some of what has happened in the past several years that helped bring us to today. And in particular, to highlight the role that Colorado's youth have played in bringing us to today. In November 2013, eight Colorado youth followed a petition for rulemaking with the COGCC, asking the agency to promulgate new rules to protect public health, the environment, and wildlife resources from oil and gas operations. <clears throat> the commission denied their petition and said it didn't have the authority to prioritize protections for, for public health and the environment as it was required to um, balance protections for public health and the environment with the need to promote oil and gas development. The youth appealed the denial of their petition for court, challenging the commission's interpretation of the act. After losing in the district court, the youth won an important victory at the Colorado Court of Appeals in 2017. The Court of Appeals agreed with the youth and said that the act required the commission to protect public health and the environment first and foremost over other interests and did not set up a balancing test. However, the commission appealed the Court of Appeals um, victory for the youth to the Supreme Court. And in January, 2019, the Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals decision, <clears throat> holding that the commission was required to promote oil and gas development and foster the development of oil and gas resources and that it could only prevent and mitigate adverse health and environmental impacts if doing so was cost effective and technically feasible. This was certainly a significant setback for the youth and a decision that many Coloradans disagreed with, but rather than accepting this outcome, Coloradans and the General Assembly immediately got to work to amend the act. And by mid-April, just three months after the Supreme Court decision, Governor Polis signed, um, was signing SB 181 into law. Now the commission is working to promulgate the rules that SB 181 requires and that Colorado youth have been asking for for the past seven years. So I wanted to close by saying that while Colorado youth may not regularly appear before this commission, I wanna make sure you keep them in the front of your minds as you embark on your new role as commissioners. Not only are children uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of oil and gas development and climate change, but the decisions that the commission makes today will have a profound impact on their lives and the Colorado that today's children will inherit as they grow up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bellinger. Next we have uh, Kate Merlin. Ms. Merlin, you should be unmuted and are able to speak. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me start my video. Uh, my name is Catherine Merlin. I'm an attorney and I represent people who've been injured by oil and gas and a lot of nonprofit organizations that try to prevent these harms. I represent them before the commission as well as state and federal court. 
uh, I wanted to welcome you to the new commission and thank you for being here. Um, please forgive my six week old baby in my lap. Um, I hope that by the end of this rulemaking that I won't see you guys very much. As much as I'd love to get all to know all of you better, it would be much better if my clients weren't injured and if they could just live in their homes and raise their kids without the threat of enormous, dangerous, and highly impactful oil facilities within a few hundred feet of their homes. This rulemaking is the fourth rulemaking since 1985 that has dealt with making health and safety rules. I'm not sure how many wells they had in Colorado in 1985, but it was a small fraction of what we have today. In 1985, they didn't have directional drilling, so you could only have one well in a location. You'd see a pump jack slowly rolling over in an alfalfa field. Today you have mega pads that can be 10 acres with 15, 25, 30 wells or more, compressors, tanks, flares, and other infrastructure. Lights on day and night, noise day and night, odors that represent who knows what is in the air. These things don't belong anywhere near the homes where people live, and as long as they're there, the people are gonna keep fighting. In addition to the, those direct threats and direct impacts, we're dealing with climate change. Fossil fuel development is borrowing against the future. Profits today are earned that are creating enormous debts that will have to be paid tomorrow. The state has put mandates on reductions to climate emissions and reducing reductions from oil and gas development is crucial, indispensable to those efforts. This new commission is here because SB 19181 created a new professional commission. In addition, the, the law flipped the mission of the commission. This happened because the Colorado Supreme Court announced that under the previous statute, the commission's duty was to foster industry and that health and safety protections could only be undertaken to the extent that they were cost effective and feasible. The word that the commission used was balance. The legislature found that was unacceptable and amended the statute. The commission's duty is to protect human beings, not to balance lives against profit. It's easy, but it's not, it, it's not easy, but it is simple. When industry and its supporters ask for the status quo to be maintained, they're asking for something that is impossible under the law. The old paradigm is out the window. Cost effectiveness and feasibility are out the window. For too long, far too long, human beings and, the, and their lives, health, and their children have been put in the back seat while industry was fostered. The industry claims that they already protect public health, but who is more credible on the issue of whether people are safe? The people who are making money off of development or the people who are living in the shadow of development? Lobbyists who claim that industry is clean or scientists who warn us of enormous methane emissions, enormous VOC emissions coming from industry. What about the EPA who's rated our air quality as seriously out of compliance? We the people achieved a hard one, a very hard one victory with the passage of SB 19181. It's the fourth time the legislature has tried to get the commission to try to protect people over profits. But every time the law has added health and safety to the mission of this commission, the industry sent out its lobbyists to make sure that it still comes out on top. Please don't let that happen again. I Climate change can't wait. But, the kids can't wait. But your Those time don't has expired, Ms. Marie. Thank you. Please listen to people, not profits. Thank you. Next, we have Barbara Vasquez. Ms. Vasquez, you are unmuted and uh, can speak. Oh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Barbara Vasquez, resident of Jackson County, a retired chemist and engineer, and a member of Western Colorado Alliance. Jackson County, as you may know, and as was described by our commissioner, Kobe Corkle, is a very rural county and I live on the fringes of the county. So with your permission, I will turn off my video because my bandwidth is very low. I am an example of why we need better rural broadband. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, to introduce myself and our organization to you and to welcome you, the new commissioners, to this daunting task. The issue before you this morning is the funding crisis for COGCC occurring in the midst of the COVID-19 economy. I'd like to note that the primary reason for the shortfall in your revenue, as you know, is driven not by the current rulemaking in Colorado, but by a significant drop in demand and a sub for your funding. We support the maximum increase in the mill levy. It will be an insignificant cost to producers only 60 cents per thousand production. It's critical that COGCC have the funding to continue to perform its function and to realize the mandate. 
if COTCC is significantly underfunded, it will need to triage its budget with the protection of public health, safety, environment, biological resources, inspection, compliance, and the rulemaking prioritized over other functions such as permit processing. These functions are critical to all Coloradans, especially those who live near us that the bedrock of SB 181 is statewide rules. All Coloradans deserve the same protection. Rural Coloradans are not second-class citizens. Protection of them and the rural environment and the biological resources are important to support the evergreen outdoor recreation economy, something many counties look to during the bust part of the boom and bust cycle for oil and gas. We realize that this increase with the mill levy won't completely close the COGCC budget hole and look forward to participating in any future conversations that might provide legislative solutions to this issue. The COVID-19 economy be, will be with us for at least two or three more years and the decline in fossil fuel basis for your current funding structure continue to decline as we finish the transition to renewables. I want to thank you for your time and look forward to working with you as you continue in the FOOTS complete the SB 19180. Thank you, Ms. Vasquez. Next we have Betsy Leonard. Ms. Leonard, you are unmuted. Yes. Um, thank you, for commissioners, for allowing me to speak with you today. I am a retired environmental educator living in Battlement Mesa. And I'm on the board of the Western Colorado Alliance, which is a grassroots organization that um, is concerned with the health and welfare of people and the environment as well as the environment that supports them. Our organization welcomes all of you who have taken on this job of, this thorny job of creating the new rules. We look forward to working with you to craft common sense oil and gas rules that protect all of Coloradans equally. We are as susceptible to smells and air pollution just as they are in other parts of Colorado. We support the COGCC raising the mill levy to the maximum permitted under the current statute to support its administrative and enforcement functions. Our organization can be counted on now and in the future to support measures designed to protect the COGCC revenue sources and ensure that industry pays for its own oversight. Thank you for allowing me to address the commission. Thank you, Ms. Leonard. Next, we have Michaela Steiner. Ms. Steiner, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I just want to welcome this new commission and I wish you all the best um, as you transition into your new roles. Um, my name is Micaela, and today I'm speaking on behalf of 350 Colorado. Um, today, we are urging the new commissioners to address the role that the oil and gas industry plays in threatening public health and safety, particularly in regard to disproportionately impacted communities of color, low-income individuals, and others who are already more vulnerable to public health risks such as the coronavirus. A critical way that the commission can help protect vulnerable communities from the impacts of fracking is by immediately suspending extractions operations at Bella Romero Academy. Elevated benzene exposure due to oil and gas activities immediately adjacent to the fourth through eighth grade Bella Romero Academy in Greeley is unacceptable. And it is a perfect example of environmental racism underway in our state given the history of the decision to site this oil and gas installation next to a school with a majority of students who are students of color. 
a report released in March that was conducted by Barrett Engineering PLLC revealed that benzene emissions at Bella Romero Academy in Greeley exceeded health standards appropriate for schools on 113 occasions, while the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment took measurements from May through December of 2019. It is the responsibility of this new commission <clears throat> to protect public health and safety and to adopt the most protective standards for toxic emissions from all oil and gas sites near occupied buildings and especially by schools. We need to continuously monitor the emissions at these sites and make this data available to the public in real time online. We also ask the commission to issue warnings whenever these thresholds are approached and immediately shut down operations if they exceed standards. Especially in this time of unprecedented health concern and in the light of systemic injustice that has become very apparent in the news recently um, and that contributes um, to disproportionate health impacts facing communities of color, low income individuals and others who are already more vulnerable to public health risks. The need for environmental justice in all aspects of public policy and in this particular case concerning oil and gas development can no longer wait. We call on this new commission to put people's health and safety first and help meet our state's goals uh, to address the global climate crisis by rapidly phasing out the approval of new drilling permits and supporting a just transition away from oil and gas towards a renewable energy economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Sophia Shivers. Hello, commissioners. My name is Sophia Shivers, and I would like to say welcome to the commission. I look forward to working with you in the future. I work with 350 Colorado, and I am a member of the Colorado Youth Climate Strikes. I'm here to speak for the youth around Colorado. I would like to echo the appreciation for the opportunity to speak here online. As you well know, we are in the midst of a respiratory pandemic, and as I hope you know, the fumes and byproducts of hydraulic fracturing weaken the respiratory system and leave communities more vulnerable to infection, severe illness, and even death. An article by The Guardian states that research shows that continued exposure to air pollution raises infections and emissions by about 10% and, death, and deaths by 15%. This study, coupled with growing evidence out of Europe, China, and the US, shows that COVID is exacerbated by dirty air. This paints a dangerous picture that I hope Colorado can avoid. Your job as a commission is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of communities and the environment. Your predecessors failed to adopt that mission change, and we dearly hope that you take it more seriously. My future and the future of my generation lies in your hands. I implore you to make the courageous decision that sets us on the right path for the future. Please do not continue to allow the profit of fossil fuel companies to come before my survival, the survival of my generation and generations to come. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next we have Amy Allen. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. In the interest of public health and the climate, the COGCC should not permit any new oil and gas wells. Additionally, the COGCC should compel all operators of oil and gas wells in the state to cease operations until the COVID-19 pandemic has been deemed to be over. The current respiratory health crisis necessitates urgent action. It's worth noting that even the natural gas industry would acknowledge that Colorado residents are being asked to sacrifice their health for the sake of natural gas consumers abroad, given the current glut in domestic supply. A study by Cui and others in 2003 concluded that exposure to air pollution increased the fatality rate from viral respiratory diseases, of which coronavirus is one. Work by Dominici and others in 2020 at the Harvard School of Public Health has identified a link between exposure to high levels of air pollution and mortality from coronavirus specifically. Oil and gas operations in Colorado are already having adverse consequences on public health, air and water quality, and the environment. Work by the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado has demonstrated that emissions from oil and gas operations can contribute to as much as 35% of summertime peak ozone levels on the Front Range. An increase in orphaned wells due to bankruptcies of oil and gas companies, including Colorado's own extraction, will only compound this. The COGCC should increase the level of financial assurances required from oil and gas well operators. 
Orphaned wells across the country are already contributing to a crisis of rising methane emissions, as reported in a July 13th story in the New York Times. A recent study by Carbon Tracker concluded that the cost to plug a shale well was on the order of $300,000. Existing orphaned wells in Colorado, as well as those that will inevitably be orphaned in the future, will present a huge burden for public health and the environment, as well as Colorado's taxpayers, if this is not addressed. Please take this to heart and cease all permitting of new oil and gas operations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Jamie Jost. Ms. Jost, I believe you are unmuted and can speak. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Good afternoon, Chairman Robbins, Commissioners, and Commission staff. My name is Jamie Jost, and I'm the Managing Shareholder of Jost Energy Law. First and foremost, I'd like to offer my sincere congratulations to each of you as the first members of the new historic Colorado Professional Oil and Gas Commission, and would like to thank the former members of the state's Voluntary Commission. I would also like to congratulate Julie Murphy on taking the helm as director. Each of your experience and expertise will serve critical roles as we all embark on the groundbreaking rulemakings, as well as the daily regulatory work ahead. As a brief introduction, Jost Energy Law is a Denver-based, 100% female-owned and staffed energy law firm that represents our resilient oil and gas industry throughout Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico on all local, state, and federal aspects of oil and gas development and production. I've regularly practiced before this commission for almost 18 years and hold a tremendous amount of respect for your roles as you do not have an easy job. I've had the pleasure of working with and practicing in front of some of you for over the past decade, and I look forward to continuing to engage with you in the future. For those of you I have not met, I look forward to meeting you in person. So just basically, thank you for the allowance to say a friendly hello and congratulations today. And also thank you for your time, your dedication to your new positions, and for your commitment to the safe and responsible energy development in our great state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jost. Next, we have Kelsey Wazinkley. Wazilinki. Um, you are unmuted and can speak. Thank you very much. My name is Kelsey Wazilinki. I'm a shareholder with Jamie Jost at Jost Energy Law. I'm going to make my comments brief and echo Jamie's expression of thanks and congratulations to all of you. I also look forward to the day when I can meet those of you who I have not yet met in person, but until then, a virtual hello will have to do. Jamie said it well that there is important work ahead. I'm incredibly proud to work with such a committed team of women at our firm and also with our clients to ensure that the safe and responsible development of energy resources in Colorado continues. Jamie and I will be actively involved in the upcoming mission change rulemaking hearings, and we appreciate the challenges in front of us all as we implement the important mandates of Senate Bill 181. Thank you for committing yourself to this process and I look forward to working with you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Simon Saya. Simon, you are unmuted. Hi, thank you for your time, commissioners, and this opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Simon Saya, and I'm here today as part of the Grassroots Environmental Organization 350 Colorado. And I just wanna give my perspective and talk about fracking in this chaotic time, how it's apparent and obvious that we must make it more swifter transition to renewable energy future and bring an end to fracking in Colorado and all future oil and gas installments in Colorado. I myself live within four miles of the proposed Crestone CDP site, as well as 1,300 kids at my high school and 1,400 in the surrounding Mahat and Gum Barrel communities. So this is personal to me and many others, and like many others across Colorado who have already felt the impacts of fracking, most of these people being of color or low income, you can all see that it's time to move away from fracking and toward towards more renewable, sustainable options. And in this time of COVID-19, the health effects are even worse for people with respiratory illnesses. When the increase in serious outcomes of, of people who have contracted COVID-19 because of pollution from fracking wells, these emissions of volatile organic compounds and cancer-causing benzene, among others, should be halted for at least 30 days and until the pandemic in, is contained in Colorado and serve as a clear reason for why fracking is not acceptable in Colorado for the health of the people. Why should we allow something that obviously severely impacts the health of our people to continue and will continue to do so if not stopped? Not to mention the climate crisis that we face today, we cannot afford to put more Coloradoans at risk, nor can we continue to fund the fossil fuel industry in this time of a climate crisis while we are already falling behind on mission, obje mission objectives. We must make a transition 
to renewable energy and a sustainable way of living here in Colorado to achieve these goals. And one of these steps is a ban on fracking and a halt on all new oil and gas installations in Colorado for the sake of our people, our health, and our futures. In this transition, jobs don't just have to be lost from those working in the fossil fuel industry, but can also be created in the renewable energy industry with solar wind or geothermal or whatever the state must do. In a just transition for Colorado, we can make this a reality, but first we must stop the, the enemy of the oil and gas industry and all new installments in Colorado and of fracking that hurts so many and in the end takes away much more than it gives to us. Thank you, thank you for all your hard work commissioners and your time today. I know we're all in this together and I hope we can make a more prosperous Colorado for all. Thank you. Ms. Larson, you're on mute. Hello, um, my name is Patricia Nelson and I'm here today to speak to you on behalf of myself, my son who is a student of Bella Romero, his classmates, and everyone else in my community who is not able to take time off of work to attend this hearing or who is unaware that they have the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm actually standing in the soccer field at Bella Romero Academy. You can see the operations that are happening right behind our school. I'm really glad that I can do this remotely. So for those of you that haven't seen the atrocities that are happening at the school, you can see them now. Um, a few things I'd like to mention. First of all, is we'd like to demand that these wells get shut down. Between May and December, 113, there were over 100 instances of of exceedances of benzene that were recorded by equipment provided by CDPHE to allow this operation to continue with state sanctioned poisoning of our children that would affect them for the rest of their lives. We're also asking that there be a minimum 2,500 foot setback implemented across the state. This is a standard distance used to in evacuations in cases of oil leaks. With new studies coming out of Colorado, um, Colorado must increase quality monitoring and impose penalties for any violators of those standards. Colorado must also accept Colorado must also adopt safer standards. Currently, the state uses a 24-hour EPA standard that is most appropriate for a nearly 200-pound fully grown adult. We cannot allow standards like these to be used when trying to protect our children. The CEO of COGA and others on this call have claimed that this is a clean energy and they talked about a healthy economy, but they have not talked about a healthy Colorado. Need I remind you that Colorado has an F rating for air, air quality. I come from a county with the highest number of wells in the state, nearly 20,000 according to the COGCC data dashboard as of this morning. And we also, there, Weld County is also the county with some of the highest number of low birth weights, stillbirths, and asthma. You can keep the wells in Weld County, but you cannot keep the air and the pollution in not only sleep impacts of oil and gas operations on our environment, but also on the health of Coloradans. You have elected officials on the call talking about the concerns that regulations will hurt the industry and how much they rely on that revenue. And that speaks to the fragility of this industry and these elected officials must learn to diversify their economies. And I'm, I'm from a county that is reliant on oil and gas and I am afraid for what our future looks like. Despite the claims of a strong, of providing lots and lots of jobs and being such a great contributor to our economy many of these companies even today are failing and going bankrupt laying off thousands of coloradans not only will colorado taxpayers have to be the ones who clean up the mess but it will also be the responsibility of the commission for allowing this to happen i really hope that you guys are able to see what is happening if you look on your screens right now you can see this operation and I'm standing on the soccer field beyond this privacy fence are the wellheads and everything else that goes on in oil and gas operations is happening to the right. Ms. Ms. Nelson, I apologize for interrupting, but your time has expired. Thank you. Next up, we'll be calling Marie Venner. Ms. Venner, I believe you're unmuted. Thank you and welcome. I represent a coalition of Colorado business owners in two statewide coalitions of faith communities. I'm a 23-year Colorado business owner, three generations in the state from an ag family on one side. 
Um, as a earlier speaker said, I'm a mom and former 4-H'er too. I've served on state, local, and regional levels of government. And note that 27 Western Slope elected officials have asked for increased air quality regulations on oil and gas. As a long-term professional in infrastructure and the environment, I know that the industry continues to say we have the best regs in the world, but we have the worst air quality in the US. Big issues are coming up, cumulative impacts, cum continuous air monitoring, and it's so important to hear from the public in these forums and, and elevate those voices. After all, we're the ones paying to resolve these issues in the interests of our health and the environment. Not hearing or acting on these responsibilities will only cause the commission credibility loss. There are about two oil and gas related spills a day in Colorado. An oil and gas worker dies on the job once every three months in Colorado. From 2006 to 2015, Colorado had at least 116 fires and explosions at these operations. And each torches chemicals containing dangerous components that companies aren't required to disclose. But beyond life, health, and suffering, Coloradans want to know how this commission will handle closing non-producing wells and abandoned wells, with over 40,000 wells already abandoned. It's up to you to find out what is leaking, ensure they are plugged, and that future costs are not foisted on citizens and other business owners. This industry is becoming well known for making a mess and not cleaning it up and giving execs bonuses before declaring bankruptcy. Colorado can't afford to keep approving more oil and gas extraction with the huge gap the state faces meeting greenhouse gas reduction levels required by law, 26% reductions by 2025, and with the shortfall and absence of sufficient coverage for well closures. Closure of horizontal wells are costing about 300K on average. We are relying on you to ensure coverage and financial assurances for each and every well. 5% leak methane from the start and near 100% leak within 30 years. Further, research has found the global spike in methane over the last decade is largely due to US fracking, which has found, been found to be more damaging than coal when upstream leaks are accounted for. We oppose further exports of fossil fuels from Colorado and investment in connecting to the Jordan Cove increasing dependence in an, on an industry that is phasing out. Oil and gas activities are responsible for 40% of the pollution that has resulted in the EPA reclassifying Colorado air quality as in serious violation of air quality laws, harming children and adults on a daily basis, including my family members, and increasing the risk of severe outcomes from COVID. Extract and then I, I apologize for interrupting, but your time has expired. Okay, please put people in our health first. Next, we'll call on Holly Hill. Um, she had to, she had been up earlier, but had to leave the meeting and is now back. Let's see, Ms. Hill, you should be unmuted. All right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate put it, you putting me back on the list. Welcome and congratulations, commissioners. I'm Holly Hill, the regulatory manager for Keras, which is a privately held company that was created in 2009. Keras acquires, develops, and produces affordable, clean burning natural gas in the Piance Basin of Western Colorado. Keras own int owns interests in approximately 400,000 net acres of leasehold and minerals, making it one of the largest mineral rights owners in the state of Colorado. Keras leases approximately 245,000 net acres of federal minerals, and much of Keras's planned development will occur on federally owned surface, which makes Keras one of the largest operators on federal lands in Colorado. In 2019, Keras's annual production was nearly 400 mm CFE a day, which is an amount equivalent to 30% of the annual natural gas consumption in the state of Colorado. Keras's scientists and geoscientists and engineers have identified projected future production development for the next 150 years. This is all to say 
that we, Karis, are deeply committed to continuing to operate responsibly in Colorado. It is not uncommon to find one of the roughly 200 Karis employees out and about enjoying Colorado's beautiful outdoors. Through the hard work and dedication of our staff, Karis is proactively committed to safety, to the clean burning of natural gas, and acting as stewards of our communities to protect Colorado's wildlife and natural resources. We look forward to demonstrating Karis' commitments to operating responsibly and mindfully in Colorado. We look forward to continuing to work with the Commission staff who work diligently and fairly within the parameters of complex rules. And we are eager to work with the Commission on the upcoming rulemaking. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Next, we have uh, Ms. Therese Gilbert. Ms. Gilbert, you should be unmuted. Um, hello, commissioners. And uh, I've been before, uh, before you in years past. And Ms. Murphy, uh, congratulations, because I remember testifying before you, before the Bella Wells were approved um, in, I think, January 2016. Um, I listened today, I'm a founding member of Welder and Water and a teacher up here in Greeley, and I listened to some of the narratives this morning, especially from oil and gas, and um, they're a little nonsensical at this point. Um, to say that 181 has had an impact on their operations is kind of ludicrous, any more than my nine years of activism has had an impact. I've had no impact. I've testified, I've gathered thousands of signatures, and I have had no impact on the industry. The bottom line is, is basic economics, Saudi Arabia overproduced, there was lower demand, prices dropped, and it put some of the smaller producers out of business, and now they're bankrupt. That's economics that my seventh graders would understand. That's supply and demand economics. So that being the case, now that the wells at Bella Romero, um, and it does, one size does fit all because we have to remember those wells are 400 feet into the county. So the county commissioners controlled that site. So now that uh, extraction um, filed bankruptcy in May, and the Friday night before they failed to make their bonds, they paid out $6.7 million to uh, some of their executives. I myself uh, get the letter in the mail as I am a force pool that my mineral rights were stolen from me technically by extraction. And now I guess I'm gonna pay also, not that whatever, I'll pay to bail them out as well. I guess my essential concern is these companies are not sufficiently bonded. And when they bankrupt like they will because we are moving to renewables not because we care about people or endangered species or the air, it's just cheaper. So we're moving to renewables because it's cheaper, because Saudi Arabia can produce a barrel of oil for $5, and they will, and we can't. So I guess my concern is the taxpayers, we have suffered the economic externalities of higher asthma rates back here in Weld County, and now what people won't like if they don't care about health and safety and air quality and endangered species, they won't want to pick up the bill for plugging these wells. So just case in point out there at Bell Rep Romero, you have 11 wells out there. Now they own the 38 acres those wells are on. I don't know how this works. Can you put a lien on the property? How can we hold extraction responsible? If not for paying me for my mineral rights they took, at least plugging those wells so that they don't leak and add to further exposure of toxins to the children who go there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Next, we have Katie Orton. Hey, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to chat with y'all. Um, I, well, I kind of changed my mind. I had something to talk about, but um, I started reading about um, some of the emissions targets and just kind of caught my eye because it says here that um, we're supposed to have like greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets of 25% reduction by 2025, 50% reduction by 2030, and 90% reduction by 2050. 
and I just kind of started thinking about it over the past hour or so. Um, I'm 24, I was born in 1995, and I just kind of urge y'all to think about what 2050 is going to look like for you guys when uh, maybe I'm your age, when I'm on a commission, and what, you know, what I'm going to be looking at. So I just kind of wanted to, I don't know, inspire you guys to think about the future and kind of address the role that the oil and gas industry um, kind of plays in the ability to meet our state's uh, reduction targets because it just doesn't look like um, we're gonna be making it. And I don't know what that future is gonna look like. And I don't really know if I should be even envisioning a future um, where we do have that 90% reduction by 2050. Like if I'm picturing myself uh, middle age, now I'm picturing myself in 30 years, um, should I even picture that at 90% reduction? Like, are y'all working towards that? I just wanted to, um, yeah, just encourage you guys to be visualizing the future while we talk about this, because this isn't more than, um, I mean, I know that you guys are just, just now starting and um, this is a big task, but it is more than just tomorrow. It's more than just this week and paperwork. Um, you know, this is planning for my future. Um, this is planning for if I have kids, which at this point, um, you know, I have to think about the future. I have to think about if I want to have kids, because I don't know if I want them to be born into this, um, if we are not planning on cleaning up our emissions by 2050 or by 2025. Um, I guess I'll just mention a couple more things here. Um, the role of oil and gas well deterioration into future emissions estimates and the financial situation of the oil and gas industry are just very worrying. And I want you guys to really be thinking about like, how am I supposed to be investing my own money? Like, where's my, where's my investments gonna be going to? Um, I've been reading a little bit about pension funds and how, you know, we're, we're putting all of this faith into the fact that I'm going to be secure financially in the future um, by investing into fossil fuels that are crashing right now. Um, and that are probably going to continue to crash. And so we have to be really careful when, when planning for the future. Um, we have to really properly study and assess the full impact of the industry. And I think we should already be transitioning away from oil and gas. We need to be um, shutting these wells down and definitely not permitting new ones. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orton. Next, we have Mr. Ramesh Bhatt. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ramesh Bhatt, and I welcome the new commissioners, and thank you for your service, and I look forward to working with you. Um, I hope you keep the following facts in mind while you move forward with rulemaking and implementation of the rules. First and foremost, you have to internalize the idea that you have the ability and the duty to say no to fracking proposals. Senate Bill 181 is clear. Your job is to protect people's health and the environment not to accommodate the fracking industry. Simply making incremental changes that will make fracking a little bit more safer is not going to protect people's health and the environment. Second, all fracking, however well done, adds to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. It follows, therefore, that any fracking, fracking operation, by definition, will affect human health and the environment. In that case, the only way to allow Further fracking is by requiring offsets, which means for any fracking operation to be approved, an equivalent amount of pollution and greenhouse gas emission has to be removed from some other source. Otherwise, you're not really protecting health or the environment. Third point, uh, the US government uh, accountability office estimates that just cleaning up and plugging wells that have been abandoned so far by the oil industry in the US is going to cost taxpayers anywhere from 60 billion to $435 billion. billion. And these numbers are from 2018, so they're probably going to be a whole lot worse now. Thus, every time you permit a well, you are risking adding to the large burden that the taxpayer is already facing. You have to include all the true costs of fracking, from pollution to cleaning up abandoned wells and charge companies for these costs before they start production. Otherwise, it's too late. Fourth. Somewhere in the vicinity of 70 to 80% of all fracking products generated in Colorado are exported. So we are, only, we are only left with the pollution. And also right now, there are cheaper and safer alternatives to most uses of fracked gas. So it's not really necessary either here or anywhere else to be fracking. Uh, so I hope you keep all these facts in mind while you move forward with rulemaking and implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 
Next, we have Emily Tracy. Sorry, Ms. Tracy. Oh, there you are. All right. You should be Thanks. ready to go. I'm Emily Tracy from Breckenridge in Canyon City. I would like to touch on two topics, the externalities of the fossil fuel industry and climate change. Commissioner Jones earlier noted the externalities of the industry, which range from explosions resulting in injuries, even death, to environmental contamination, to health issues from volatile organic compounds. All of the above are very costly and not fully included in the cost of doing business for the companies and therefore not included in the cost of the product, skewing the fuel marketplace. I ran for state Senate in 2016 in Northwest Colorado. I met with people in Battlement Mesa in Western Garfield County, whose community is directly impacted by the industrial operations of the fossil fuel industry. Some of those folks that are attending this meeting. They need protection from state government because their local county commissioners work mostly on behalf of the industry, not on behalf of their citizens. According to a recent news article, their county commissioners are planning to use $500,000 of oil and gas impact funds to assist the industry in achieving industry-friendly regulations at the state level. I serve on the community advisory group for a Superfund site in Canyon City, a former uranium mill site that closed in 2010. So I am well aware of externalities of fuels. The site is still not cleaned up and there's not yet a cleanup plan. Noting the environment damaging externalities of the life cycle of uranium for production of nuclear fuel is a good reminder of the need to examine the life cycle of natural gas, not just the pollution produced at the point of ignition. I'm currently, in regard to climate change, I'm currently mentoring a group of trainees in the Climate Reality Project Global Leadership Training Program. There are 10,000 people from around the world being trained this month, people who want to help make change to protect our people and our world. Regarding natural gas, 2016 marked the first year that gas was the leading fuel source for US power generation and it's expected to maintain the largest share of the electricity mix through at least 2040. Our natural gas dominated electricity system continues to heat up the planet. The electric power sector is the largest contributor to US global warming emissions and currently accounts for approximately one third of the nation's total emissions. And the fuel cycle issues of natural gas will continue for decades. In addition to gas combustion problems, there is methane leakage already mentioned by other speakers. The growing body of climate change science indicates we do not have decades to gradually move away from producing and burning fossil fuels. The planet is heating too quickly and too much. We need to move through incentives and regulation to a fossil fuel free future. More Ms. Tracy, I apologize, but, but your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Mr. Eric Sween. Hi, my name is Eric Sween. Um, and thanks for the chance to speak with you. I really appreciate your service and the Herculean task of rulemaking ahead of you. I'm speaking today as a concerned citizen. I live and work in Boulder and I've been here for 30 years. I originally moved to Colorado in 1987 to work for Outward Bound and I care deeply about all of Colorado's beautiful environments. I have two concerns. I'm deeply concerned about bankruptcies in the oil and gas industry and orphaned wells. As you know, the industry is in financial free fall. Many Colorado companies are struggling, looking to cut costs, and do not have the cash reserves to properly plug wall wells. Two days ago, the New York Times ran an article about how many oil and gas companies have declared bankruptcy after giving their execs huge bonuses and then leaving their wells unplugged. Please read that article from July 12th. Plugging a well is expensive. I don't know the exact numbers. I've seen 100,000. The New York Times article estimates 300,000 
to properly plug a single well. I'm deeply concerned about the orphaned wells in Colorado being left to taxpayers leaking methane and contributing to the climate crisis. Many oil and gas companies have been effectively given a pass around environmental cleanup. I'm also deeply concerned about the future. Please, please take the long view. You've heard from a lot of industry folks today. Yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic and they are dealing with economic pain, but climate change is forever. Just like COVID-19, this is a global issue. We will see more forest fires, more beetle kill, hotter temperatures, more drought, less snow in Colorado. Estimates are that we have less than 10 years to turn around our CO2 and methane emissions. We cannot keep doing what we've been doing with oil and gas extraction. We can't keep drilling. We have to be bold in our thinking. We have to think about the future. We need real leadership. There's a reckoning that's coming. Please think about future generations. Please think about your kids' kids. Don't lock in permissive rules for the oil and gas industry for years to come with Senate Bill 181. Please take the long view. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Sween. Next, we have Larry Foreman. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Larry Foreman and I'm chair of Battlement Concerned Citizens. Uh, Battlement Mesa is on the western slope and has many drilling pads surrounding the community, drilling pads within the community, and a drilling pad next to our water treatment facilities. Our main concerns are strong chemical odors from gas pads, leaking pipes from gas wells, drilling that happens close to home, and water pollution. All of these problems have happened in our area in the last seven years. Battlement Concerned Citizens wants the COGCC to have adequate money to regulate the oil and gas industry in Colorado. We also want the companies that produce natural gas to have adequate money for maintenance of wells and the plugging of wells. Thank you for taking, taking on the difficult job of establishing rules that improve the health and quality of life for many people in Colorado. Thanks. That concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Ms. Larson, um, looking that we're about 15 minutes out um, from our scheduled time, can you give us an update on how many more people there are to testify? Yes, we have nine more individuals um, to call on, and there are three folks um, that signed up, and we sought to find them earlier in the day and haven't been able to find them. We're still looking to see if they've logged in. Um, so we have approximately, oh, probably a half hour worth of uh, okay. public comment yet. I would suggest we march on um, and just keep going and um, get everybody uh, heard that signed up. So thank you, thank you for the update. Sure. Next we have Lynn Granger. Ms. Granger, you should be ready. <coughs> Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to our new commissioners and congratulations on your appointment to this incredibly important professional commission. My name is Lynn Granger and I'm the executive director of the American Petroleum Institute, Colorado. We are the Colorado division of API representing all segments of America's natural gas and oil industry. Our nearly 600 members produce, process and distribute most of our nation's energy. API Colorado and its member companies are committed to ensuring a strong, viable natural gas and oil industry capable of meeting the energy needs of Colorado in a safe and environmentally responsible manner. Public health, safety, welfare, and the environment are truly our industry's top priorities. By way of background, API was formed in 1919 as a standard setting organization. In our first 100 years, API has developed more than 700 standards to enhance operational and environmental safety, efficiency, and sustainability. Our standards are implemented and executed by the natural gas and oil industry across the world, including right here in Colorado, with many of our standards being written into COGCC regulation. For this reason, we urge you to utilize us as a resource as you embark upon this new challenge. 
Colorado already has some of the most stringent regulations in the nation, and while we are proud of this accomplishment, we acknowledge there is still work to be done. While I understand that natural gas and oil production can be a very emotional topic for some, I urge you all to continue to ensure that regulatory decisions are rooted as they should be in facts, data, and science. I very much look forward to working with each of you in the weeks, months, and years to come. It goes without saying that we definitely have a lot of work to do, but I want each of you to know that API Colorado is here for you as a resource and as a partner. Thank you all for your time this afternoon, and I hope that you settle in well to your new roles. Thank you, Ms. Granger. Next, we have Joanne Hakos. Ms. Hakos, you should be unmuted. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to take part in this in this commentary today. It's been really very interesting and helpful. And thank you to the new commission for uh, working carefully to uh, move forward on the uh, new rulemaking and the new mission change. I represent the Wildlife and Biological Resources Coalition, a group of uh, a large number of public organizations that are interested in the uh, preservation of Colorado's natural environment and our wildlife. Uh, are you seeing me, by the way? Is this working? Yes, we can see you. Okay. Uh, the uh, coalition represents people who are uh, dedicated to the preservation of uh, wildlife, pollinators, uh, plant species, uh, and, and birds. And we're very concerned with the impact of the oil and gas development in Colorado on those natural resources. We appreciate, by the way, the, the work that the commission has done so far on the new draft rules to preserve wildlife and biological resources, but we recognize there's much work to be done. I also represent, uh, as a member of the coalition, the Audubon Colorado Council, which uh, we have more than 25,000 members in the state of Colorado from the Audubon uh, societies throughout the state. And we are very worried about the impact, the continuing impact of oil and gas on the natural environment. We know, for example, that oil and gas development has had a major effect on uh, increasing the endangered bird species in the Colorado, the endangered plant species. And we hope that the commission will work very carefully with the state wildlife uh, action plan that lists the endangered and threatened species in the state and that th those will be taken seriously in providing for alternative locations and really evaluating the cumulative impact of oil and gas development throughout the state on our natural environment. We know that the income from people who value Colorado's natural environment far exceeds the income from oil and gas. Thank you very much for allowing us to participate in this activity today. I hope that we can work together on the new rulemaking. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Andrew Forks Gundmanson. So, Andrew, you should be unmuted. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, congratulations to all the new commissioners um, and thanks to Commissioner John Mesner for apparently not getting enough punishment the first time around. Uh, glad to see you back on the commission. Look forward to working with you in the future. Um, my name is Andrew Forkus Goodmanson. I'm the Deputy Director of the League of Oil and Gas Impacted Coloradans, LOGIC. Um, we were founded in 2015 to elevate the voices of Coloradans living with the impacts of current and proposed oil and gas development at uh, the policy and decision making tables. Our goal since our inception has been to give impacted Coloradans a voice and to bring about public policy and regulatory changes that protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment, wildlife resources. We have been working uh, for the last four years to connect impacted Coloradans with their state and local decision makers. Um, that includes the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Uh, we were heavily involved in the uh, passage of SB 181 and we've been involved in the related rulemaking since uh, they got kicked off. I'm here today uh, to 
tell you that little bit about logic and to ask that as this rulemaking process goes forward that you recall that you're the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, not the Front Range Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, not the West Slope Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, not the Eastern Plains Colorado, uh, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, but the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It's your job to develop rules that will protect all Coloradans. We all deserve to br breathe clean air, drink clean water, and live in spaces that are safe for us to live and recreate. Um, we've heard a lot today from operators and their allies that some places in Colorado are doing just fine with oil and gas development, so they should be allowed to pollute to their heart's content. Uh, I don't believe that that's acceptable. Our members don't believe that that's acceptable, and you've heard from various members of the impacted community across the state that that's unacceptable. Um, we ask that you, uh, Keep in mind the, the mandate to protect health, safety, and welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources over the profits of the oil and gas industry. And to remember that um, emissions everywhere impact Coloradans everywhere. Um, Colorado uh, has set a set of fairly ambitious greenhouse gas emissions targets for um, various years going from now till 2050. And if we ever want to hit those targets, we cannot be approving oil and gas operations in places just because their air quality is slightly better than that in Denver. So I ask you to remember those targets, to put those targets in your heart and work very hard to meet them, and to remember that all Coloradans desperately need help um, and that we need clean air for all of our Coloradans. And uh, I'll, in the interest of getting us out of here as soon as possible, quit talking. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next we have Theron Mackley. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Congratulations and welcome to the new commission. I can't imagine going into this new role in the crazy times we live in. Your responsibilities are now even more important than ever. And those responsibilities extend beyond the state of Colorado because what we do here influences the whole world. There are several changes going on that make your jobs even harder than past commissions. I want to talk about a few of those and then talk about what I think you should do. Firstly, there's a new increased emphasis for you and new responsibility on health and safety and the climate. That's a big one. Coupled with that is new knowledge in the world about the things you oversee. We now know that air quality is even more harmful to human health than previously thought. We're running an experiment called COVID that's proving that out. We also know that our air quality standards are not strict enough and that stricter standards would save even more lives. We also know that at the federal level, we're being let down. The EPA has relaxed both its standards and its enforcement. So it relies on you to pick up that slack. And lastly, the harmful pollutants that cause air pollution have been tracked directly to the industry that you oversee. There's no doubt about it anymore. Lastly, on the climate side, and this is newer information, we know that in order to save our world, that our greenhouse gas emissions need to go to zero as soon as possible. It's not a debate anymore, it's a fact. None of these bode well for the industry you oversee. You oversee. The writing is on the wall. It is clear to me that you now have a new mission, one that is 180 degrees to what your commission has done in its history. Your new responsibility is to wind down this industry as soon as possible, ensure it's done safely and responsibly. Everything you do going forward needs to keep this in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Mr. Tom Rhodes. Yes, thank you. My name is Tom Rhodes. And I live in Fort Collins in Larimer County. I would also like to uh, welcome the new members of the commission and congratulate you on uh, your new roles, um, although maybe condolences might be more in order, given that I know that you'll be unable to make everybody happy uh, with the rulings that we'll be making with the COGCC. Of course, 
your role now is not to make everybody happy. It's to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens and the environment. I would like to, as a previous caller uh, had mentioned, commend you to the uh, New York Times article, which was published two days ago. It was entitled, Fracking Firms Fail, Rewarding Executives, and Raising Climate Fears. This article cited two Colorado-based uh, fracking companies in particular, Extraction Oil, which we've been hearing a lot about because of their drilling next to the Bella Romero Academy. Um, they declared bankruptcy on uh, just last month. Three days before doing so, they paid $6.7 million to their top executives, then turned around and declared bankruptcy. Whiting Petroleum declared bankruptcy on April the 1st. Six days before they filed for bankruptcy, they awarded $14.6 million to their top executives. Now you'll hear a lot about how the oil and gas industry is working to preserve jobs and create jobs here in Colorado. But these two firms laid off 30% and 20% of their line employees before declaring bankruptcy. That $20 million could have gone to save those jobs. They're not interested in creating or preserving jobs in this state. And the work will continue because Grizzly Energy, which has already twice declared bankruptcy, is now buying up oil and gas leases here in Larimer County. It is up to you as members of the COGCC to ensure that there is financial viability behind these firms to ensure that all wells are adequately bonded and ensure that those bonds are not subject to future bankruptcy proceedings. You are charged with ensuring the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens and for the environment. That includes ensuring financial stability for the operators who are extracting our resources and selling them elsewhere in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Nancy York. Hi. Hello. Are we good? Yes, we are good. You may begin. All right, thank you very much. And I, first off, I wanna congratulate the commission, new commissioners. And uh, I particularly appreciate the fact that you're going to hold uh, citizen participation uh, frequently. And that's, that's the best way to hear from the people. Uh, I want to appreciate the difference between rural and urban communities. Uh, and. Uh, the big equalizer, though, is climate change. And the climate crisis will affect us all. And I encourage this commission to advocate for and work with other agencies to provide retraining of lost jobs, um, the lost job holders, and, uh, I all, and expand uh, renewable energy. I live in the in the front range in Fort Collins, and uh, where uh, oil and gas development is is intense. Uh, out of comp and and our area is out of compliance with ozone for years. Um, we know that methane leaks are and venting is even greater than once was known because of uh, infrared imaging. Uh, studies are, show that air pollution affects every organ in our body, including our brains. Brains. Uh, even, even carbon, black carbon has been discovered on the fetal side of the placenta. So my, uh, I, I believe that we should cut harm to people's health, the climate crisis, and to taxpayers' dollars, that we should 
insist on bonds to cut, just as Tom Rhodes just said, cover the cost of plugging orphan wells and that they see that they're, they'll uh, cover their costs throughout. And um, I believe that there should be a moratorium on, on new oil and gas development. And I say, time's up. Time's up as far as the climate crisis goes. And I so wish you the very best in your decision making. And um, and I hope you, if you err, you err on the side of, of the climate, of, of people's health and the environment. And then on uh, lastly, the taxpayers' money. So good luck to you all and uh, you'll be hearing from me in the future. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. York. And finally, uh, we have Ms. Shana Oliver. <clears throat> Ms. Oliver, um, give me a moment and you will be unmuted. You're unmuted. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Okay, thank you for providing this opportunity today. My name is Shana Oliver. I am a field organizer for Moms Clean Air Force living in Colorado, representing more than 43,000 members in the state. But most importantly, I am a mother of four children. My children and I are tribal affiliates of the Navajo Nation, descendants of the genocide known as the Long Walk of the Navajo. I was born at Shiprock, New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation. I currently live in Denver, Colorado with my children and husband. And today I am urging you to adhere to House Bill 1261, including Senate Bill 181, in protecting com communities whose health is put at risk from breathing harmful ground level ozone pollution, which is contributed by oil and gas development and operations. I come from a long an unfortunate tradition of living near polluting industries. As an indigenous woman born on the Navajo Reservation, I lived with coal plants, oil and gas drilling, and uranium mines as my neighbors. Like other children on the reservation, I was born prematurely at low birth weight and with a birth defect that wasn't detected until later in life. As an infant, I was diagnosed with asthma and struggled to breathe when the air quality was poor. Indigenous people have higher rates of asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancers, men mental illness, adverse birth outcomes, and premature deaths in the general population. My family had to move away from the reservation so my father could find a job since the coal, and coal plant and the oil and gas didn't pro provide enough jobs for the community. When Indigenous families leave the reservation, we are systemically segregated and redlined into communities that have been set aside for affordable housing areas. Often the only option is to live next to highly polluted industries that spew toxic chemicals in the air and contribute to ground level ozone or smog. I live near the Suncorp refinery in, in nearby Commerce City that has a long history of violation and is the second largest polluter of volatile organic compounds in the state which can contribute to forming more ozone and affect health, as well as this area of North Adams County has um, promoted um, oil and gas drilling around single family homes, as well as near the North, um, um, the refuge um, arsenal area. Um, compounding the ozone air pollution problem is all the oil and gas development in the state. In December of 2019, the EPA reclassified the Denver Metro and the Front Range as serious non-attainment zone. We are a 10th ranking for most polluted zone cities by the, Lung, the American Lung Association State of the Air Report. The oil and gas threat map has alerted me of yellow smoggy days here in Denver County. This is a serious problem for people like me who have asthma and I, I am deeply concerned about the quality of air that my children are breathing. Please adhere to House Bill 1261, including Senate Bill 181. Our children need a breathable future now and going forward. It is time to transition our communities 
can transition to so that our um, communities can transition to an equitable future. Thank Ms. you for Oliver? taking my comment. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, that concludes public comment. We uh, were able to get through everybody that was on the list, Ms. Larson? We were. There were still three individuals we have not been able to locate. Um, okay. Um, well, uh, thank you um, to all the Coloradans and others who testified before us today. Um, we appreciate the testimony. Um, we do plan on um, uh, having an opportunity to receive information from, from folks. Um, I would turn it over to do any of my do any of the, my fellow commissioners desire to say anything at this point in time before we adjourn? Not seeing anybody unmute themselves. So, um, okay, well, um, again, uh, thank everyone for uh, coming and uh, participating with us today. Um, we uh, certainly appreciate the various viewpoints um, that we receive. Um, we will meet again next again on uh, July 28th will be our next meeting um, of the commission. Um, and uh, we are, um, you know, gearing up for the mission change rulemaking for the latter part of August and early September. So um, again, thank everyone for uh, uh, showing up and providing good insight to this new commission. And, and with that, um, I think we'd have a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the motion carries. We are now adjourned. Thank you.